Welcome to the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival and to the world premiere of Radium Girls. My name is Molly O'Keefe. I'm the Senior Director of Artist Programs at the Tribeca Film Institute and it is my pleasure to be co-sponsoring this screening with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, the Sloan Foundation has been is the one of the founding partners of the Tribeca Film Festival and longtime partner of the Tribeca Film Institute, supporting projects that are um, tackling thematically projects in math, science, and tech. Um, Radium Girls was fortunate to come through that program, as are a few different films that um, have been at this festival. Uh, we are so, so honored to be a part of this. This film celebrates so much of what TFI stands for female voices on screen, behind the screen, and then obviously our longtime partnership with the Sloan Foundation, so this really has, is sort of like a perfect, perfect blend of everything we support at TFI. Um, I am going to introduce our incredible partner who, without his support, a lot of our programs wouldn't happen. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you from the Sloan Foundation, Dorn Weber. Thanks, Molly. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here again. Um, so the Sloan Foundation, where philanthropy makes uh, grants for research and education and science, technology, and economics, and one of our signature programs, I mentioned this on Sunday for those of you who are here for the screening, is called the Sloan Research Fellowships, and we give it to scientists in mid-career. And what's important about that is 48 of them have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. And I mentioned that to, so to tell you that we're good at picking winners. So when I said that on Sunday, we were introducing the world premiere of Sean Snyder's To Dust, and last night, Sean Snyder won the best new narrative director at the Tribeca Film Festival. So, so who knows what awards this film is going to win. Um, uh, we're, we're very, very proud of this film. It won, like Sean's film, actually, won an award at uh, NYU Tisch that we uh, make, a $100,000 first feature award. And um, it's also, as Molly mentioned, it's a film by women, about women. We're very proud of our support for stories about women uh, we were involved with uh, the book Hidden Figures. There's a documentary, uh, Bombshell, about Hedy Lamarr. The play Photograph 51 about Rosalind Franklin. And when we did our film summit, which we do every three years in Los Angeles in November, we had about 120 winners uh, of filmmakers, and over 60 of them were women, I'm very happy to say. So this is a, a, a remarkable thing. We want to hear more of, from these voices. And this story is a, a very important story. There's going to be a panel after. I hope you stay for it. And I would just mention that it's about one of the uh, uh, misuses of science. It's based on a very important discovery. And science, of course, is amoral. It's just uh, a systematic effort to understand nature. And it's a question, it's up to us how we use it. And this film is going to explore that in a really wonderful way. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce the two wonderful co-directors of this film, Ginny Moeller and Lydia Pilcher. Please welcome. <laughs> Um, there's so many people here who were a big part of bringing this film to life. And um, we're so excited to share it with you. It was uh, six years ago that Brittany Shaw and I began writing this screenplay. And when we first came across the story, we couldn't believe that it wasn't a movie because their story is so powerful. So it's very surreal to be here six years later and um, a real honor. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's been a long journey starting at the beginning with Brittany and Jenny. And somebody asked me this week, how long does it take to make a movie? And I said, well, uh, my mind went to baby. And then I thought, well, that's only nine months. But the baby thing stuck with me because I think the journey of making this film, which has been longer than nine months, um, has been one of collaboration. And it's been one of an expression in the, set, in the grander scheme from many, many people. We have many talent in the audience tonight. We have many of our department heads, our creative collaborative. We have um, really amazing um, investors who are um, women that we're very proud to be standing on the shoulders of. Uh, and I think that you know, whether, you know, whether we're making a film, whether you're writing a novel, when you're making a building, you're making a meal for your child, your baby, um, it's all a, it's all a piece of your heart. It's all you, all of it is a combination of um, your expression and who you are, and the collective expression into that synergy 
um, and doing it together is what makes movies just the most, uh, you know, privilege and amazing opportunity, you know, that we could ever have. So we're really excited to share the baby with you tonight, and I uh, hope you enjoy. And this is her uh, directorial debut. Yep. Mm -hmm. co-producer and co-director, and it's technically uh, her directorial debut of a full-length feature film. Um, she's um, a, a long-time uh, award-winning producer, two Emmy Awards, an Academy Award nomination for a slate of films that's um, truly incredible. And uh, Dr. Betsy Sutherland, who is really a treat to have on this panel. It's unusual to have a, a, both a historical and very current perspective on the actual subject matter of the film. She's had a 40-year-plus career in um, environmental science. She has a PhD in environmental science and engineering, and spent the past 30 of the 40-year uh, career at the Environmental Protection Agency, leaving only recently, <laughs> and um, we're, we're going to really have a great time understanding uh, historical context, emotional context of, of the film, um, and the perspectives from uh, these great women. So, um, you know, there's a lot of themes in Radium Girls that really uh, connect us to, from history, to the stories of today. But for the panel, just so you know, we're going to talk about for a little while, and then there will be a little time for Q&A, so you can start to think of that as we go along. Um, one big theme, of course, is the idea of female power, this overarching uh, mandate that you saw in the film to um, use it um, for the good of individuals and the betterment of society. And I'd like to hear a little bit about the, the literal connections you thought about as you were crafting the film and what attracted you to the story um, with the obvious parallels to uh, the Time's Up movement and the Me Too movement of today. But also just as important, um, you know, really what I think even your press materials term as the assault on public health, on the workplace, on protections and tactics um, that we saw in the film that go on today. But, um, uh, we're here at the Tribeca Film Festival. Thanks again for staying. I, I'm going to start with a film question. So it's pretty broad. Try not to answer every single theme of every single question we could possibly <laughs> ask, but it, but it is a pretty broad tier. You know, how did the film come together? How did you identify the subject and turn it into a narrative script? Where did it Where did it come from? So um, so. Brittany Shaw and I were working together at a documentary production company about six years ago, and the project that I was on... Six years ago. Six I'm years ago. On. Six years six ago. Six years ago. Filmmakers. And, um... Babies uh, in first grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was um, sort of randomly assigned to a documentary about the Manhattan Project and uh, as an archival researcher, and I started doing all this background research on it, and I was reading an army general's autobiography about the project, and he was, it was kind of a dry section. He was talking about health insurance for the project workers, and he said, we all remembered the tragic dial painters of World War I. And for some reason, I stopped, and it just sort of like a, you know, a big question mark went off, and I, yeah. and I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know what a dial painter was. And so I looked at that, I Googled it, and a Wikipedia page came up called Radium Girls, and I was floored. I couldn't believe the story. I couldn't believe, you know, not only what these women went through, but also the way that they fought back when there was so much stacked against them and so many people afraid to speak out. And um, I actually recently found the original email that I sent to all of my coworkers, including Brittany, that was just like, what is this? Wow. Um, <laughs> and so it's February of 2012, and then wow. we had known about the Sloan Grant from when we were at NYU mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and um, you know, bef and it's it's a grant for a feature film that is science themed, mm -hmm. and this film is so obviously centered around science. There's so many different 
parts of, um, of this film that circle around science. And so we, we said, we, you know, I mean, first of all, we said, how is this not a movie already? Like, it's so yeah. cinematic. Has, it, has the topic ever been on film, either documentary or a narrative feature? There's a documentary from the 1980s called Radium City that's amazing. Uh -huh. um, and it actually interviews a, a living Radium girl who wow. has since passed away. But um, nothing fictional. And so, and so we knew about the Sloan Grant, and so we had a great deadline to motivate us to yeah. start writing, and, yeah. um, and that's, that's So it, it's a period film. It's a tough subject. Cancer, radiation, workers' rights, female cast, first-time directors. Really easy to get the financing together. Just <laughs> off put your hand up and you know, flew in like a superhero, or had that, had that uh, well, yeah, all well, go down. You know, we, Jenny and I developed the project, you know, with Brittany. Um, yeah. It, it, it began, it, it began a process of um, sort of figuring the right, you know, the right way into, you know, building the story for a, for a big screen. And um, this, you know, having this Sloan grant was a big deal because any, you know, and I, I say this as a producer in general, any time you can get your first cornerstone in for financing, it sort of gives confidence to other investors to come forward. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I found that on a number of films that I've produced, and, um, it, and it's, it, it really is. That first chunk is the yeah. most meaningful chunk. I call it the cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And so Sloan was the first one, and that, you know, then um, in turn brought other um, grantors in. So we had, you know, a grant from the Richard Bay Foundation. We had, um, you know, we ended up with, um, who else? Jerome. Jerome Foundation. We also recently got a NISCA grant um, through Women Make Movies for the, you know, for the finishing of the film. And so all of these, you know, all of these elements were really um, important. We knew it was going to be a small film. Yeah. Um, we knew, we had, you know, that was, you know, we weren't sure what, how small or what the size or how to amplify the story that we had. Um, we ended up, um, you know, proceeding, you know, with what we had and then, um, as we went and feeling really confident about what we were doing, um, even through you know production and into post production, and then we, um, I had been working on another film with um, an executive producer, um, Harriet Levy and Lily Tomlin, and um, they read the script. They really loved the movie, and they you know Lily and Jane Wagner and Harriet were like you know we just want to do whatever it is yeah. to help you get this movie done. And Harriet activated the network and you know brought. These amazing theater producers together, and you know, here we are. <laughs> um, it is actually interesting for filmmakers in the audience, or you know, people who wonder about um, sort of the state of, of uh, film funding. Not to get too technical, it is incredible that there are foundations giving money. I recently uh, produced a documentary called Generation Startup, and you know, it, it's about venture capital and diversity and tough cities where uh, business doesn't happen. And uh, the cornerstone for that film was a foundation grant. And it's, um, you know, I think of it in terms of documentary film and not so much fiction, but the science angle really played into that. So that's kind of interesting. Um, just in general, I'm going to ask you from the fundraise point, but I wonder from the audience, I can sort of see before this film, just a show of hands, who had heard of the Radium Girls? So some, which is amazing, but not a lot. There was a book published last year. Yeah. But one of the things that was really interesting for Ginny and I to realize once we really got into it is that there is kind of a network of high school uh -huh. plays that are being produced about Radium Girls. And mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. Put it on your Google or alerts. You get one about every day. Is that it's right? really <laughs> interesting. No, it's really interesting. Because, and Jimmy yeah. even did a version and workshopped it at her high school. Yeah. Because I think it really speaks to you know it really speaks to young young girls, young women who identify with this age group. I mean, they were teenagers. Right. Well, you know, another thing to uh, identify with um, is, you know, there's a few common themes. Uh, in the film, and just turning to the workplace and science of it and environmental um, impact of it, which is kind of a modern word, you know, environmental science and, and so forth. But, you know, 
the common themes that we just saw, there's whistleblowers, right? There's the question uh, that's so apparent there, and we'll get to the um, question of women and, and so forth later, but also sacrificing your career, great, great reputational risk. Um, I, for some reason, the, the pinning the syphilis on the women was very striking to me because it kind, of hit, it kind of hit the um, <laughs> sacrifice you made plus the woman question all in that one corporate tactic. Um, obviously risk to income and family pressures, um, but also on the science side, the suppression of information, uh, bogus experts, uh, outright <laughs> you know, lying uh, and, and conflicted interests in courtrooms. So just to name um, seven dozen common, <laughs> common themes of, of today, you know, how, how do you think about this? How do you help us, aside from the very obvious, really bridge it to what is happening today in so, this regard? So I, I was just thrilled when they sent me the film because it is so relevant to today. Um, the Trump administration right now, and this is just in the first year, has repealed or is in the process of repealing 16 worker protection and consumer safety rules and 66 public health and environmental protection rules. And in doing this, they have marshaled really the exact same tactics that the American Rating Company did. They uh, just published this week a proposed rule that would say, from now on, EPA is prohibited from using the kind of occupational health study that the Radium Girls underwent. The, the new secret science rule that Scott Pruitt put out on Tuesday of this week says, from now on, we're not allowed to use for any of our regulations any public health study where, unless we agree to waive all patient confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge issue. And then bogus experts. Uh, Scott Pruitt replaced many of our renowned university scientists with industry and state scientists who are well-known uh, advocates of getting rid of environmental regulation. And then he has certainly mounted a major campaign to discredit all the people, both specific journalists who write negative articles, outspoken retirees like myself, and of course, firing, demoting, and transferring multiple current employees at EQEA when they raised issues with his, uh, his uh, spending and his really illegal purchasing. So if we read that you have come down with a horrible case of syphilis, we should absolutely <laughs> not, not fall for that. Okay. Don't go for it. Okay. Um, um, we, I'm sorry. The syphilis thing, I don't even know why it struck such a cool terror in me. But, um, you know, there's this emotional side to the story. The sisters, the death of the third sister. Um, the dynamics between the women on the floor of the factory, the dynamics between ultimately um, the person they got to turn, you know, who is uh, uh, the floor manager or supervisor. Um, there's also this historical side to the film. So when we say period film, you know, we think as producers, I have to get, you know, cars and costumes and, you know, make sure that there's nothing from after that period in the film, you know, I'm thinking that way, but from a historical perspective, you know, I wonder if you can speak to the nature of the filmmaking for a second and where the incorporation, it's your wheelhouse, but, but you know, the decision to incorporate the stock footage, documentary footage, and how that came from the research piece into the art of the film. It looked spectacular uh, on, this, on this screen. I mean, it, uh, it, it, again, another lesson learned, even as a filmmaker, I you know, was sent a link to watch the film in advance of this panel, and it looked beautiful. But it looked stunning on this screen. So anyway, but back to the uh, archival nature and the decision to include it as an artistic form. We, um, so 
as, as Brittany and I were writing the screenplay, we were still working as archival researchers, so we were spending our days combing through archival footage, and she, she was working on um, a film about the Civil Rights Movement, and I was working on this Manhattan Project film, and, um, and then at night we would get together and write the screenplay. And we would come across these sort of little pieces at, mm -hmm. as we were going through our day, and would just kind of tag it, like um, the Mount Rushmore eclipse, the guy swinging on George Washington's nose that was in the title sequence, um, was just something that I stumbled across. And it, it actually informed the script in a way where we didn't know, I hadn't known before that, that Mount Rushmore was built in the 1920s. And, um, and so that led to the inclusion of that, you know, in, that in the actual scene. And um, we were just, Part of, part of our experience there, part of my experience there was really falling in love with history for the first time through these images and through seeing that it's real and these are real people and this is, you know, this is an actual document. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that was just something we wrote into the script from the beginning and it, and it did take a lot of forms, you know, it used to, um, there's, there's one angle of it where it's more experimental uh -huh. use, even more, even more than this. And, um, but it was always something we knew we wanted to include, and that actually came into the conversations about producing the movie in terms of how to create a, a big historical scope uh, for a low budget. And then, I don't know if you want to talk about how we shot all of it, or yeah. shot it. Well, we, we were sort of playing with the idea, of, you know, in, in order to kind of thread it through to make it feel like it was one film, to, we, we were using the idea of, um, we shot a lot of um, our own actors with, the, with black and white bolex. Um, you know, members of the Communist Party, Etta, who was the camera woman in the film, and Radcliffe, who was the reporter, mm -hmm. you know, characters who would likely be in some of the archival footage at the time. And then we, you know, so we took those images and wove it into the archival to kind of make it feel a little bit more holistic. I think for our budget, because we wanted to uh, convey what was, you know, the scope of the film and kind of what was happening in the time, and it was it was a way to really um, thread that, you know, thread that level of scope into it. Well, I feel like for me, um, something that the historical and archival footage did, both created and um, acquired, was really set the context of this sort of disconnect between the the, the Roaring Twenties. You know, really, in retrospect, we have the advantage of the um, thing we all studied, the Industrial Revolution, but also knowing the Depression was coming just a year later in this timeline, and how, you know, absolutely free of moral, you know, it wasn't just the, the very biggest oil barons, et cetera, but everyone was operating at full capitalism, full profitability, all the things that science and technology unleash in the context of uh, suffrage, where the women's right to vote and all those powerful images was just uh, probably, was it like 1920, uh, the, right? And so, you know, how much did you inform the actors and, and sort of steep them in this historical energy as you were directing them? Or did you leave that aside and concentrate them on the emotions of, of their scenes, of their characters? I, th I think it, it um, was a case by case basis. I think sometimes actually what would happen is just like I would, get, I, we would be talking about the scene and then I would get really excited about some backstory stuff that I knew about it and then we would talk about it in that way. And um, definitely I remember I feel like I brought like this big pile of reading for um, Colin who plays Walt and I was just like, yeah. yes, like this. And, um, and he's like, oh, we shoot tomorrow. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but, um, but I also think, you know, the, a lot of the connections were, were drawn in the cut in yeah, terms of, I see. in terms of including the, the w women's movement as this really big piece of it. Well, it's interesting because as we, um, well, I mean, some of the characters like Catherine Wiley, who was the um, head of the Consumers yeah. League, and this was this was a very big um, sort of middle class women's movement right around this time of. Um, that was a real character. Yes, yeah, she's yeah. a real character. Um, she she was the one who had the contact, the connection with Walter Lippmann, who with the, with the New York Post, who helped really elevate this story to a national level, which is really important. And, and she's understanding. We'll try this in the court yeah. of. 
Oh, yeah. the opinion when they got the postponement. Yeah. Uh, couldn't overturn that. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think I think it was when we were really getting into the editing with the, um, and trying to sort of figure out how to contextualize the Catherine Drinker story because yeah. she and her husband were scientists. They they were at Harvard. They were commissioned by American Radium to do this study, mm -hmm. and then and then they were bound by an NDA, yeah. and 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 the report was completely forged and submitted to the New Jersey. So we felt like we needed to we you know we needed to excavate that. A little bit more, Surfacing. and we discovered that Alice Hamilton, who was the, also a, a Harvard professor who um, was really specialized in occupational health and uh, industrial toxicology, and she, we found that she wrote the letter to Catherine Drinker saying, "Come on, yeah. you know, yeah. or, which side are you on?" Basically, yeah. right? And that was very um, significant to us, and we felt like it was important to include and. Time's Up hadn't even happened yet. Right. When, we, right. when we sort of felt like that was, and, and I think that you know some of the historical advisors that were involved with the film had um, had really also said, you know, you're really hitting on something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like women, you know, won the right to vote, and then they really wanted to use it, and they were all. This was the era when yeah. these were the issues that women stepped up to. Yeah. Well, one, one question, just, I really want to talk a little bit more about the science and so forth. One other um, sort of historical question is, in terms of historical accuracy, real characters from history or created or blended characters, um, just in terms of the issue of diversity and race, how did that set of characters come into being, both the sort of widening of the lens, getting out of that grandpa's house, getting out of that factory, you know, this eye-opening, I can change the world. These people convene and talk about important things and have fun, two things not in their lives is changing their own world or having fun until that moment. How did those characters, the photographer and the co-conspirator reporter, um, come into being? They, um, you know, I think a big part of that is because we, the other documentary that our company was working on, um, the company we were working for, was this really beautiful um, two-hour special for the History Channel called Stories from the Road to Freedom. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and um, so Brittany especially was immersed in that footage all day, every day, for months and months and months. And we felt that, you know, we were so passionate about the Radium Girl story, but we also felt that that was so important to include, especially yeah. because so much of what, of, of the material from that was from the same era, mm -hmm. and we saw, oh, and, really? and so, you know, learning about the Tulsa race riot, we said, like, we, ha we have to put this in the movie, yeah. and at some point, you know, I think it was just sort of, it's like, you know, can you, you know, there's an idea of, like, maybe you don't have to make all the movies in one movie, right. <laughs> right. but, um, but, you know, we, Etta and Thomas just kind of, came to they life. They emerged. They emerged and um, and and they were, you know, we had we wanted Bessie to have a love interest and we had Walt and he was he was with Etta and Thomas yeah. and and they emerged and um, you know I think there's probably another version of the movie that's Etta's story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But um, we wanted we wanted to have to have it there even if even if it wasn't the whole movie. And I, I think it helped juxtapose because, you know, I, the, the two characters, the two sisters, I mean, at the beginning of the movie, they're like these young women with a, a big future in front of them. They, you know, Bessie lives in her imagination. Joe has big dreams about becoming an archaeologist. And, you know, all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out. And, yeah. But there's a, there's a real sort of coming of age in terms of really understanding what that real world is like. And, it's a, and, and bringing in, you know, other characters with other experiences to just kind of say, you know, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happening out there yeah. that you don't know. Right. Um, and, and the door literally opens yeah. you know, for them on, yeah. onto it. Um, so just... Turning to um, the, the science of it, uh, or, or lack thereof, from a company's perspective, you know, and threading this needle, which is not too hard to thread between the then and the now, you know, you've spoken about the repeal of these, you know, public health initiatives, um, the basic dismantling of, of the EPA and these systems for 
communication, science, truth, etc. But specifically today, it's hard to actually know. It's such a barrage. What does the dismantling do specifically to workers' rights in general and, and possibly to women and women's health and or workers' rights in industries that predominantly affect women? How do those things tie together? It's such a morass. Every, every headline is you know, the same size font, you know, it feels like sometimes. How does it relate specifically to the workplace and women in the workplace? So, so that's when I think um, a lot of the early concerns about the Trump administration were on climate change, which is a hard thing for just regular people to grapple with because you go, geez, I'll be dead, my kids will be dead, you know, I'll worry about that, you know, in some future time. But what the real dismantling that's occurring right now are things that are going to affect us literally this year, next year, our children, our grandchildren right now. And that's because what uh, all our workers are usually exposed to toxic chemicals at a higher dose, thank God, I guess, uh, thank God for the rest of us. Um, and so they're kind of the canary in the mine. And when um, this administration repeals so many of the worker protections and so many of the toxic chemical prevention kind of testing, that means our next round of workers, not, not years and years from now, but next year and the year after that, are going to be exposed at these very high levels. And then when that contamination gets back into the environment, into the things we eat, or the things we breathe, or the things we drink, the rest of the population is also going to be exposed. And of course, women and children are always considered some of the most sensitive people. A number of these chemicals will pass through the woman's bloodstream into her fetus. When she gives birth to that child, it also passes from her breast milk into that child. We have contaminants now, 80,000 chemicals. Many of them have not even been studied. And what they're doing fundamentally is even changing the way we're allowed to study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why it affects everyone. Um, so start to think of questions, because I'm basically going to uh, tee up one more question here. Um, uh, and then we'll go to you guys. Um, I want to make a statement first and then ask my favorite question to ask filmmakers. Um, just, you know, there's two women who are credited as co-directors and, you know, if we're big film aficionados, we can think of the Cohn brothers, we can think of the Duplass brothers, we can think of the Wachowski siblings, we can think of the Stranger Things brothers who, for me, came out of nowhere, but more, more, more brothers. Um, um, is there, in our recollection, a female co-directing team of a narrative feature? Hmm. So you may be looking at the first one. We'll get a thousand angry emails. That's not even the fun one. The fun one is, for me, maybe a little sadistic, but fun. What was your worst day on the set? <laughs> what was it? Lights went out, pouring rain, it snowed when it wasn't supposed to, food poisoning. Well, OK, so on the snow, <laughs> not that any of those have ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> on the snow, actually, it was our final day of shooting. We were up in the beautiful Lake George region mm -hmm. in New York. and. Um, and it was the end of October and it snowed and it was the day we were shooting all of our exteriors. Almost all of our exteriors. And it was yes. snowing and it was so beautiful. But, but, really? but we were just planning on getting your average establishing shots and, and going in and out of Wiley's office. So um, a lot of the scenes where they're going in and out of Wiley's office, it's snowing. Wow. And um, it was, I mean, it actually added this amazing production value and Lydia, um, <laughs> Lydia went into this local, um, oh, uh, well, I mean, like a antique store, antique store and and started, started pulling everything out on the street. Like, yeah, like, uh -huh. <laughs> this guy was so nice. We had just we, and the snow was falling on it. It looked beautiful, but it was it was definitely not the not, plan. Not expected. Not yeah. the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna open it up. But we're gonna open it up for questions. 
Now, I think we're going to come to you with a mic, or you can shout it out, and I'll repeat it if we can. First of all, I thought that was really interesting how, I thought it was very well done and pretty seamless how your character, Be Bessie, I guess, um, uh, her evolution, because I was like, at the end, I'm like, I'd forgotten how innocent and in her little brain and, you know, uh, lost in thought that she was. So that was really well done. Um, I'm curious about the number of women that you found out from your research, how many of them died within like a two year period? And did they, in those, just the, demise of these people and what was done for them and if they were ever eulogized in any kind of way or do they just kind of yeah I, th I mean I mean anyone who was exposed to it in the way where they were in, inviting it in that way died it was um, uh, even you know, Marie Curie you know who was was only beginning to understand you know the effects as well of what was happening with radium and and when it when it really became known you know radium ta is ta taken in the way calcium is comes into your bone so there's no getting it out once it, if you you can take it in in the way that these women were doing it it's in your body forever so um, yeah, there, I mean, I think that, you know, there have, there are some books that are being written about the Radium Girls. I think there was a statue out of the Illinois Watch Factory. Um, I know, um, I, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of super fun sites um, because these fact, because it is true that this life of uh, Radium is a thousand years, so um, it's, it's still out there. Well, I think this is the eulogy, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it, we might be all just have watched it. Mm. Uh, another question? Back there? Hi. Um, another thing that I loved in the movie was like this youth energy that a lot of the adults had become kind of not cynical, but they knew the way the world worked, and they're, like, these teen girls are not going to win against a corporation. And even at the end, when you know, you can see that Bessie feels like she's capitulating even though she's getting $10,000. Like, I, I love that you had, that you let them stay youthful that way. And I was wondering what you mind, like in your own lives or just creatively to capture kind of youth energy, which I think is something that's also showing up in a lot of our current events today. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, uh, something that we talked a lot about when we were writing the screenplay is just like, you know, what would it feel like to be 17 and have this happen? And um, I still really identify with my 17-year-old self and just like the, the, the joy of, of being 17 and also just like the uh, extreme feelings that come with being 17 all the time. And, um, and so I think, and you know, both of us, it was like, you know, we'd be writing the screenplay in our pajamas, like in Brittany's bed. It was very like... Um, I think that I think that vibe was always there for us, and we always wanted to capture that about the girls because they were teenagers, and they were just suddenly like had their world turned upside down. But they were they were still teenagers, and, and how do you reconcile that? I, I was also very drawn to these ideas from the Book of the Dead, which um, Brittany uh, Shaw had made a film about uh, that involved themes of Egyptology and I think that was how those themes came into the script and um, the line that uh, Joe says that at the, toward the end that the book of the dead did you know the book of the dead is actually the book of coming forth into light and I thought that was such a beautiful idea because I think that I think that what um, what we tapped or tap, tried to tap into with our girls was a sense of idealism that you know we don't have as easily today and that idealism comes from a deep inner sense of meaning and the moment of what we do and each day what we do what we decide to do um, I think that that there's something that you know ideally I don't know that thing about a three-year-old just wants to be happy I think that there's an idealism in youth because you feel that sense of future ahead of your uh, ahead of you and that that's a really, really important thing to hold on to. I think it's what, you know, it's, it's the fundamental, you know, cornerstone for resistance. Yeah. Um, um. 
Thank you. Another question I saw right there. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know anything about this story, so very well educated and uh, moved. Um, you talked a lot about the footage that we saw that was uh, documentary in nature. I was curious about the court, because it had courtroom suspense as well element to it. So I was curious how much of that research that you did for the courtroom pieces. Well, it was, you know, the, the, their trial, to, you know, was extended and, and, you know, the struggle was extended over a longer period of time. So I think our challenge as filmmakers was, was how to sort of condense it and keep the essence of the overall beats of their saga. You can actually, the, it's fascinating, the transcripts of the trial are, are all at the Library of Congress. The lawyers, his, his papers are all at the Library of Congress. Wow. And um, it was great to go there and... and uh, that hasn't been shut down yet, or...? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one last question we have time for. Right there. <laughs> what can we do? This is for the scientists. Well, I was going to, uh, that's a great question, and um, there, there's two quotes that struck me re-watching the film, um, and this one uh, is not the answer, but it's a great moment in the film. I'm going to tell you a secret. It never ends, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. so that was really overwhelming to, to hear, but in answer to what can we do. So, so I would say there are two things. Absolutely vote <laughs> and, and get those guys out of there. Um, and then number two, there's a number of groups that are litigating all of these repeals and they really need your donations. Uh, so Earth Justice and RDC are, are just two of the ones um, that are very active and you can check it and Google it. Uh, what everybody's trying to do because, again, just in the first year, 66 public health and environmental rules are being repealed, and we have three more years to go. So donate to those groups, and, and they'll let the judges throw them back out. Um, so one, one, one last thing here. Thank you very much. Um, great questions. And I just want to say um, the other note, we didn't really – Hammer the direct connection to Time's Up uh, and the Me Too movement. Um, the, but you know, every day is a momentous day in government, but also in in uh, the Me Too and Time's Up regard. The, every week is a momentous week. Both a lot happening this week. And the other quote that I you had to have written it before October 17th of 2017. Um, is really something uh, to think about and so prescient and you're obviously thinking about the, these issues of truth. And the quote was from the grandpa in that beautiful scene by the river and what he um, said, first of all, spoke to youth, that his eyes were too old to see it the way his grandchildren saw it. Um, and then he goes on to say straight out, I believe you, I believe everything now. And that is so chilling that, that uh, you wrote that. It's so important to you know, think about as we're going through these uh, next news cycles. I just want to congratulate you again on the incredible film, the incredible work. Thank you. Thank you.